rendezvousing and eventually landing in the Crew Dragon. So monitoring the spacecraft systems, helping out the commander as we go through all of those different phases. So that experience of understanding how a spacecraft does those things really helped inform my experience with the new vehicle. Um, and then, of course, all of the work that you do in space, um, you're, you're always building on the previous lessons that you learned. So even though there's a lot of differences between the missions, um, there's a lot to, of similarities as well to build on. Yeah, definitely. So what was it like riding and living in the Crew Dragon versus your experience on the Space Shuttle? Well, the goals of the two vehicles are similar, to get us from Earth to low Earth orbit, um, but, the, but the way they do it is a little bit different. Um, the Space Shuttle also can take large payload into orbit, so it requires a huge amount of fuel to get the Space Shuttle into low Earth orbit. Um, and uh, the solid rocket boosters, when you first light off and get off the launch pad, you're, you're kind of shaking, you're rocking and rolling, you feel a little bit like a rag doll. Um, the Crew Dragon, the Falcon 9 rocket, is much smaller, just launching just people and not a lot of cargo into space. And so it requires less energy to get you there. So a much smoother ride was my experience of the two. Um, and Crew Dragon, of course, is quite small. So we spent uh, almost 24 hours in Crew Dragon. The four of us, it was a very small space. Um, the Atlantis Space Shuttle is bigger than Crew Dragon, so we had more room to move around. But of course, it, it's got nothing on the space that we have near now here on the International Space Station. For sure, that sounds awesome. So the ISS is this amazing orbiting laboratory, and specifically within the fields of astronomy and astrophysics, which are two areas that Hubble specializes in, what sort of work is being done up there? Well, the International Space Station is a great platform for doing astrophysics research as well. It's outside the Earth's atmosphere, which of course can interfere, the atmosphere can interfere with particles that astrophysicists and astronomers want to observe. So this is a great platform for some instruments. We have a few that I know of. One is called NICER, which looks at the composition of neutron stars. Another one is called MAXI, and it's an X-ray all-sky monitor. And then of course there's the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, um, which has been here for I think about 10 years. And and it's um, part of the search to understand dark matter. Um, we, as astronauts living here, don't interact really with those payloads very much, although I know that they're very important to the astrophysics community. Although a few years ago, AMS had a situation similar to Hubble, where it really needed a, a repair job, and it wasn't designed uh, to be repaired in space. And so a really ingenious team of engineers and folks on the ground developed the tools and hardware and procedures needed so that astronauts could go out and do some really tricky spacewalks to recover that instrument. So it does have that in common with the Hubble telescope. That's pretty cool. That's really interesting. So let's see, what are some of your main responsibilities and goals during your time up there? One of the really cool things about being an astronaut as part of an expedition crew on the International Space Station is it's kind of all your responsibility, right? So you have to help keep the space station running so there's maintenance involved. So you're working on maybe the water reclamation system or maybe you're working on the toilet. Um, but you're also the, the hands um, and eyes and ears for the scientists on the ground that are sending their research into space. And so you're doing um, a part of their research projects for them. Sometimes it's as simple as changing out cartridges in an experiment that runs independently, but sometimes it's as involved in thawing out, you know, human cells and um, putting, providing them with a treatment and then incubating that and then sampling it and preserving it to return that science to Earth so this, the, the principal investigators can examine what they've learned um, by making use of this microgravity laboratory. So it really is, it's a whole lot of everything, which is really cool. Yeah, that sounds like a lot of fun. So going back to the last Hubble servicing mission, you were living inside the space shuttle for about 11 days, and now you've been living up on the ISS for a little over a month now. So have you noticed any like day-to-day -day differences between what it's like living on these spacecraft? Absolutely. Well, the first one we talked about already is obvious. There's a ton more space. It's like 6,000 square feet up here in the International Space Station. It's a lot of room to move around. Um, I could be in a module, and I can see right now three modules and I don't see any other people and I know that there's a lot of other people up here so it's a really big space which is interesting. Another main difference between a short duration mission and a long duration mission, the short duration mission you really train the heck out of every single thing that you know you're going to do um, and the days are very intense and you've got to get all that work done that day even if something goes wrong you've got to figure it out that day and get it done. Um, space Station has a very different pace. We're going to be here for six months, we're in it for the long haul. Um, you have to pace yourself and bring that energy every single day. And 
and you haven't trained to do every single thing that you're going to do um, in detail up here. And so you're, you're kind of constantly learning new things, which is also very exciting. Definitely. And let's see, NASA has a lot of exciting missions ahead, especially with human exploration. And Hubble really helped NASA lay the groundwork for spacewalks and using tools in space. So could you tell us a bit about the Artemis program and how the missions that you've been a part of are helping prepare NASA for this next giant leap? Absolutely. I'm very excited about the Artemis program. The Artemis program intends to land people on the moon again in the next couple of years. But more than that, it intends to develop a sustainable presence on the moon. And we're going to be working together with our international and commercial partners to achieve this. And there's a lot of things that we need to be able to do, right, once we get there to, to study and stay on the moon. We're going to need, you know, new landing technologies, new suit technologies, new rover technologies, habitat technologies, including power systems and water water systems and all kinds of things like that. So, um, all, and all of those things are in our development path to sending people to Mars, um, which is amazing that that's going to happen in my lifetime. I'm super excited about all of that. Um, and the work that we do right here on the International Space Station informs all of this development. We are a research platform for all of these things. And so even this summer, we're going to be installing new solar arrays that are smaller and more efficient than the ones we've had working here on the space station for over 15 years. Um, we're also um, upgrading our water reclamation system all the time, and so we're learning all of these things that are going to inform the development for our future exploration missions. So it's very exciting to be a part of this right now. Absolutely. So we probably have a lot of kids watching right now. So do you have any words of wisdom or a piece of advice for young people or specifically young women who are looking to get to where you're at right now? I think the best advice that I can give young people is to not be afraid to try new things. One of the things that I've discovered um, as I've been an astronaut is that there's always something new to learn. And sometimes it might be something that you're, hey, you're naturally, you're really good at this, you have a knack for it, you get it right away. And other times it's going to be something you have to work at or something you think, oh gosh, I'm, I'm just not going to be any good at that. Um, but don't be afraid to try those new things. Even if maybe you feel like you failed the first time around, you're going to get better at it. You're going to ask people for help. People want to help you get better at these things. And so just kind of charge in there and, uh, you know, be prepared, of course but be ready to always be learning new things. That's great. And now, before we jump into some audience questions, I'm curious, now that Hubble's been in orbit for 31 years now, do you have a personal favorite Hubble discovery or image? Well, you know, it's impossible to choose just one. Uh, I know you know that. Uh, you know, it's, there's images that are beautiful just for the way they look and for, or for what they make you um, feel. And then there's images that are amazing for what they tell us and what we have learned uh, about the universe. So if I had to just choose one, I would say that one that really stands out for me is the ultra deep field image, um, which is an oldie but a goodie. Um, and, uh, you know, my understanding is that basically we pointed the telescope at a part of the sky that looked kind of empty from ground-based photographs. And by kind of looking this deep core, looking for a long time and gathering, you know, what would, was very faint light over time, realized that there's, you know, so many countless galaxies just in this one little area of the sky. You know, we're looking back billions of light years, kind of galaxies long ago and far away. And, and I find that just very um, fascinating, very compelling to understand just the sheer dimension of our universe is kind of mind boggling. For sure. Me too. I think that's that's probably my favorite as well, though it is definitely hard to choose. <laughs> so we got in some great questions earlier this week on social media, and we can go ahead and take a look at some of those. Um, a user on Twitter asked, how long does it take to get adapted to the space station? So um, for me, it took several days to really feel like I was adapted well. Um, I experienced some nausea when I first got into space, um, which was the same as my first flight. It didn't last too long, but after that, you're kind of, you have a fluid shift that occurs in your body because you no longer have gravity acting on all of your systems. And so you end up feeling a little bit like you have a cold or just a stuffy head, which is an uncomfortable experience. And it took me about, I would say, three days maybe to get over all of that. Gotcha. Okay. And another question from Twitter. How is sleeping in space compared to sleeping on Earth? 
Well, it's interesting because um, it's a little bit harder to fall asleep in space than you might think. It's quite comfortable because you have no pressure anywhere on your body because you're just floating. But your brain is not used to just floating. You're used to having your head on a pillow or at least on the mattress or on the floor. Um, and so it does feel a little weird and it takes a while for your body and your brain to adapt to the new sensation. Right, yeah, that's a good point. So a uh, question from Facebook, kind of going into your educational background. How did you go from working with the ocean to now being, you know, floating up in space? What was that transition like? So I actually started off as a teenager thinking that I wanted to go work for NASA one day. I lived near um, Ames Research Center in California. And, um, and so I thought I, I was interested in airplanes as well, living on an air base. And so I studied aerospace engineering initially at university. Um, but I became interested in ocean engineering towards the end of my university career and then made that transition um, into studying the oceans, but always with the idea in the back of my mind that wouldn't it be great to work for NASA one day. And the way I think about it, it's not that different. Our planet is two-thirds covered in ocean, which we're not naturally suited to survive in. So we use technology to explore the ocean, whether it's a, a special kind of a suit or a submersible, or we send you know, unmanned rovers in, into the ocean or different kinds of instruments. So there's a lot of similarities. And when you go out on a ship to conduct research, you have to be able to fix any of your machinery that breaks. You have to be able to operate with what you have on hand, the team and the, and the hardware that you have on hand. So there's a lot of similarities between how we explore the oceans and how we explore space. Definitely. All right, so now we have a couple questions that were submitted on Instagram. Uh, the first one is, what do you do in your free time on the ISS? So in my free time, I do like to try to call home. I call my family on an internet protocol phone. Um, I can also send emails. And of course, I love to look out the window at our beautiful planet, no matter you know, if we're over the ocean or if we're over land. It's just really, um, it's lovely to look out the window and watch the world go by. Yeah, and kind of on that note, another question asked, uh, what do you miss about space when you're at home on Earth? Well, it's got to be floating. It really is such a remarkable way to move around. Um, you know, it, it's really, I, I'm gonna, I know that I'm going to miss that when I'm, when I'm eating dinner or, or maybe even reading a book, I can just kind of perch up on the wall. You know, I can just hop over to the side and, and just find a nice little perch to sit. Um, it's very comfortable. It's just, it's really fun. Um, you can go fast, you can go slow. You can take, you know, sharp, sharp corners. Um, it really is, you know, you never get tired of it. It's pretty great. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> and we've also been receiving some questions live during this stream. So let's see if we can get to a couple of those now. Um, from Twitter, uh, someone asked, like, how do you feel like seeing the sky changing color during launch? And how does it just feel being in space? So during launch, I'm actually really focused on the displays right in front of me. There's no view out the window for me at all. Um, and we were, you know, so we're just focused on monitoring what we're supposed to monitor, but also the sensation was so amazing. You're just accelerating, you're just go, 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 that we were really enjoying it together as a crew, something that we'd been, you know, preparing for for a while. We were, there was definitely some giggling on board um, during, the, during the launch phase. For sure. So there was also a question from Twitter earlier uh, that asked, sort of what's going through your mind during countdown and liftoff. I know you're very focused, but maybe in the moments leading up to launch, what's that like? <laughs> So we actually have a couple of hours where we're in the capsule suited and, and strapped in. And so, you know, during some of that time, we're reviewing, you know, hey, if this happens at this time, here's what actions we're going to take and here's what you're going to do and here's what I'll do and here's what this person will say. And we're kind of reviewing checklists in that way. Um, but then there's also time where we're just entertaining each other. We're either telling stories or Tama had us learning some different word games just to pass the time. So um, just like any other people, you're, you're, you know, trying to pass the time while you're waiting uh, for a while. For sure, yeah. Okay, so someone on YouTube is asking, how is like working out on the space station with exercise? What's that all like? So we're very fortunate to have three different types of exercise machines on board the space station. One of them is essentially a stationary bike. Uh, one of them is a treadmill. And one of them is a resistive exercise machine that simulates weightlifting for us. And so every day we're scheduled for um, something cardio, so either the stationary bike, bike or the treadmill, and also the resistive exercise. And we do that to maintain um, our bone and muscle health. So we, we have a great complement of um, countermeasures, basically, to the effects of micro G on our bodies. Great.
And another question, what does it smell like in space? Is there like a scent that, <laughs> that's up there on the ISS or? So that's an interesting question. Um, you, you know, we obviously we recycle our air, we treat our air, um, and so it smells like people up here. Um, and we don't have, you know, it's not it's not really fresh air. But um, the the one thing that that I noticed on my previous flight when people went out to do a spacewalk and then came back inside, um, I smelled the smell of of cooking meat. It smelled like hamburger to me, which was so strange. And it was later described to me as it's the smell of the metal off gassing. It's been out in vacuum and it's now come back inside. And that and that smell is the is the smell that the metal makes when it's been off gassing. Um, so I would say it's space smells like hamburger. Good to know. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> All right, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, so someone's asking, how do you get along with your crew members? What's the team environment like? We have so much fun up here that it's surprising to me that that um, we have as much fun as we do and we're and we're getting paid for it. It's a really tremendous crew. Um, these are the greatest guys you can imagine. We get along really well. Um, we take care of each other. We look out for each other, and um, it really it's just a great time up here. That sounds terrific. All right, thank you everyone for sending in these amazing questions. Unfortunately, I think we're gonna have to wrap things up for today and let Megan get back to work. But Megan, thank you so much for your time and for answering all of those questions. We really appreciate it. It was so cool to hear more about your time with Hubble and what you're up to right now. So best of luck with the rest of your time on the ISS. Elizabeth and everyone watching, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, thank you for being interested in what we have going on in the International Space Station. Never stop looking up. Awesome. Thank you so much. If you guys want to keep up with Megan, you can follow her on Twitter and Instagram at AstroMegan. And to keep up with Hubble news, you can follow us on social media at NASA Hubble on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Flickr. Thank you so much for tuning in and have a great rest of your day. Station, this is Houston ACR. Thank you. That concludes our event. Thank you to all participants from Goddard Space Flight Center. Station, we're now resuming operational audio communications.